This week's guest started running after his mum was diagnosed with breast cancer. He went on to carry the Olympic flame, complete his first marathon, break a Guinness World Record, finished 45th at the Silverstone Half Marathon in one hour and 20 minutes, started a YouTube channel, ran the Great Wall Marathon and Comrades, became a partner and event director and ambassador, and volunteered at major games like Glasgow 2014 and London 2017. This year, he's made the final shortlist for the 12 uh, of 12 for the best blog personal category at the Running Awards 2018. It's been quite a journey. Welcome to the show, Richard Baisley. Hi, nice to be here. Mate, it's great to have you here and, and we did start this call earlier today on video. You had a Marathon Talk t-shirt on, so you, you, you're obviously uh, one of Martin's groupies, right? Yeah, absolutely. I've been listening to the podcast since about 2012, <laughs> so uh, okay, a big fan. <laughs> oh, fantastic, fantastic. Thank you for all your support. So, so listen, you, it, you, you're one of those people in my mind that what I call a, a real runner in that you've kind of done all of it. So you've you've gone for um, performance for yourself to try and be the best you can be. You volunteered at park run events. You've run for charity. You've been a running tourist around the Great Wall Marathon and Comrades and all that kind of stuff. You've done ultras, you've done marathons, you've done short stuff. You do blogs and videos and all kinds of things. Like you are like, you just everything. You do everything in running. But it wasn't always like that, was it? No, no, I, I never really used to run when I was younger. I did a bit of track at school, as you do in your PE lessons. But then obviously I'd come out of school and I find going out with my mates and pubs and things like that. So running just disappeared from life. It was in about 2009 when my mum had just got through breast cancer treatment and was given the all clear. I really wanted to do something to give back. So I contacted Breast Cancer Now and I asked them to tell me, you know, what can I do to help you raise money? And one of them said to me, why don't you run the Great North Run? And I thought, well, what's that? You know, didn't even know how far it was, where it was. I'd never heard of it. And they talked me through it. You know, it's a half marathon and 13.1 13.1 miles yeah that meant nothing it, that I didn't know what sort of distance that meant um, but I just got out there and started training and um, I think I started in like May and by the September I'd got round the Great North Run and I did it in just under two hours um, and I'd raised £1,300 for charity so I was really happy with that. Uh, I mean it's a fascinating journey the way people can so charity runners can get a lot of sticks sometimes um and you know my journey was similar to yours in that you know suddenly i was it was our next door neighbor's daughter got leukemia in 1999 and and she was only four and and suddenly i was inspired to do something that i'd but that i knew nothing about at all and it was actually a really great way into running it, and it, it it kind of connected meaning like i think when i was at school I, I couldn't find a meaning to, to run, as it were, and it wasn't maybe it wasn't taught that well, so it was, which is one of the reasons why I didn't enjoy it. But actually, it's a really powerful way into running, isn't it? To to have something an important cause to you, and to be able to to raise money and, and do something good. Yeah, exactly. And I think you know when you're doing it for charity, you are doing it for a, for a, a cause that's bigger than you. You're not you're not doing it for yourself. So. Um, you're not doing it for personal fitness or personal gain or anything like that, but by the end of it, you, you sort of realise that this is beneficial to you as well, what you've done. Um, and yeah. and then you, you want to carry it on, really, after you've done the challenge. Yeah, and of course, but then, of course, it gets difficult, doesn't it? Because the first time you do the Great North Run, you you generally don't know what you're letting, letting yourself in for. You don't know whether you're going to be able to do it or not. Your friends don't know whether you're going to be able to do it or not. Often, as it, as it sounds like was the case here, you're probably one of the first people in your kind of friendship circle to do it. So people are, are sponsoring you because they're thinking, oh, my word, I, do, I didn't even know what that was either. But yeah. then suddenly when you've done it, if you want to carry on doing things like that, you have to raise the stakes a little bit, don't you? Because you, you, they're not going to sponsor you again for the Great North Marathon, the Great North Run again the second year. Exactly, yeah. And, and this is how it, it led on to um, the next sort of chapter. So I, after the Great North Run, I did stop running for a little while um, because uh, I hadn't quite realised the health benefits. Um, and I went back to my old habits. And then I went on a holiday with friends in 2011 and just ate and drank way too much. And I came back from that holiday... I was relaxed and I'd had a good time, but I just felt terrible. So I thought, you know, I never felt bad like this when I was running. I'm going to pick it back up. 
Um, and it was around that time in 2011, I was nominated to carry the Olympic flame in the London 2012 torch relay. Why, why, why were you? I saw that, but and it came really early in your kind of journey. Yeah, it was, was the... it was just off the back of the Great North Run and the fundraising that I'd done. Um, and I was nominated for, for doing that. But okay. I felt that, well, that was 2009. I'm now sat here at the back end of 2011. That was a couple of years ago. And I felt, um, although I was ha- proud of what I'd done, I felt it wasn't really that recent anymore. So... I decided to go for the London Marathon, so I, I went into um, London through a charity place there because by then I'd, um, I'd had my daughter and she had an eyesight condition, so I ran for um, Victor, which is a children's eyesight charity. Um, and yeah, from there, I, was, I felt like I was kind of worthy of carrying a torch then because I was doing something current, and this led us into, into 2012. And it was a mad year because obviously the London Marathon was my first ever marathon as well. And the whole training process, the fundraising process, it was a lot harder than the Great North Run. Um, and I, I was finding it really tough and lots of people were getting behind it. And then I got through to the actual race day and I, I, still, I still can't describe that feeling in words of when I crossed that finish line because yeah. it, it was just um, barriers were removed. I felt like anything was possible um, if I could do that, what else can I do was, you know, on my mind. Um, and then a couple of, couple of months after that, I carried the Olympic flame. And after doing the marathon train, I was quite happy that was only a 300 metre run. So it gave me, <laughs> gave me a bit of a, a time to relax. Um, but that's interesting, isn't it? Because we, we can get, you know, you've run pretty quick. You've run one hour, 20 for a half marathon since we can, we can get onto that. But we, sometimes so I think so many people get into marathon running with, with a performance focus they may be quite serious runners beforehand and it becomes all about the time and they you know they can be really disappointed and, and you know if they're a minute or two minutes or five minutes slower than what they're aiming for and actually I think there's a real there's a, there is a real life changing thing it certainly was exactly the same for me that life changing thing of I genuinely don't know if I can do this which sounds ridiculous now looking back at you know I'm looking at your Skype profile photos surrounded in running medals you know <laughs> you, you, you kind of you, you, it seems so ridiculous now but at the time definitely you know you, you, it is a, for many of us completing that first marathon particularly when you've never been a, a, a runner so to speak is a landmark moment where you you do think exactly that wow i've just completed something i never thought i could what else could i do yeah and it's when you start your training it seems an impossible task and mm. i still get mm. people now say to me oh how do you do these marathons you know i could never do that and i say to them well Perhaps if you stepped out of the door right now and tried to run a marathon, then you're probably right, you can't. But given six months of targeted training to condition your body to do that task, you'll definitely be able to do it. Yeah. Um, it's just putting in that time and that effort. What, what time did you run the marathon in 2012? Uh, I think it was 3.43 I did, um, r- around there anyway. And I was really happy with that. I was going for sub four at the time um, because I didn't want to set too ambitious a goal and, and fail. So I did a bit of sandbagging, I think, and got myself. <laughs> but I managed to get myself quite comfortably under the mark. So I was happy well, with what that. What's the difference between that at training and your Great North? Because you've got, you know you've run quicker than your half marathon PB there twice. So what what did you do to go from a two hour half marathoner to a three hour forty five marathoner? I think with the Great North Run, I didn't really have any idea um, what I was doing. So I just would go out and just run. But I would, I would plod along at one pace the whole time um, and just go a bit further and a bit further. But I was never getting any faster. Um, but when I trained for London, I followed the training plan off the London Marathon website. And within that, there was a few sessions of um, intervals where it would just say sprint for this long, walk for this long, sprint for this long, and, and definitely those types of sessions helped because my heart rate was getting a lot higher than it ever would have. And my body was learning to tolerate those higher heart rates and higher workloads, um, and it just seemed to gradually improve my speed over the over the marathon distance. So, so what came next? So you've, so you've gone your half marathon in, in 2009. You've you've crossed the finish line of the marathon in 2012. For many people. Uh, that and, and I'm not criticising that this at all, but then, then that's it. It's that box tick. Box ticks. Thank you very much. I'm going to do something else. What What was next, and why? Um, well, I wanted to keep um, the the kind of 
high that was on in 2012 rolling. Um, so I went in for the Great North Run again because that's where it all began and I thought I'll go mm. back there. Um, but again, like you say, you've got to up the ante a bit, haven't you, if you want to keep encouraging donations. So I decided to go for um, a Guinness World Record attempt at the Great North Run. Um, and I, just, I looked at um, some of the times on the website and I found one that I felt I could probably achieve. And that was the uh, dressed as an animal category. So obviously I had to get down to picking my outfit. This is an important decision to make. So who what was do you... the time, by the way? What was, what was the dress as, what was the time? I you think it, at the time it was set at around 150 something. So I knew I could, oh, okay. I knew I could achieve it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I asked my friends on Facebook, cause that's what you do when you've got a tough decision in life, you know? So I said, <laughs> What what should I go for, duck or lamb? And I never explained it was for a costume. They all probably thought I was picking my dinner for the night. And uh, so the lamb won, and I ended up dressing up as a sheep. And Brilliant. I ran the Great North Run with my, my bright pink charity vest on. And that was hilarious, because that's the first time I've ever run in costume. And the reactions you get from the crowds around the course, and just all the kids especially, it's brilliant. Um, and I, I got to the end and I was in the charity village uh, if you've done the Great North Run you'll know it down at South yeah, Shields yeah, yeah. and uh, Colin Jackson was walking around doing his interviews and the charity people ran over to him and said Colin, Colin he's just broken a Guinness World Record get over here and I, I ended up on the BBC being interviewed by Colin Jackson which was quite a moment <laughs> Brilliant Brilliant So how do you like I've often thought about that and I, I still think about that I mean Tony, I think Tony Got, what did he get fastest marathon as a baby I think so you know we've got you know a bit of form on the show around world records and those kind of things how do you do it like when you when you think right I want to run so you look in the Guinness Book of World Records uh, website you see the time I can do that but do you have to ring them up do you have to register yeah, uh, who, yeah. who authenticates it so you have to set up um, a profile on their website and then you have to register your interest in that attempt before you actually do it um, they then send you out a very stringent list of rules that you must follow when, when conducting your attempt. And one of those is you've got to have your costume verified. So you have to take photos of it and wearing it and send it all into them before the attempt. So they then say, yes, that costume will qualify. I actually know a guy uh, called The Running Viola on, on social media. And that's not his name, though. No, his name. no, his name's Alistair Rutherford. He's an absolutely yeah. rapid runner, but um, he, he, he's, he's the running viola because he's a musician as well. He dressed okay. as a viola, um, but it turned out his costume didn't come down below his knees, so he ran a, marath- a half marathon world record, and then it was it was voided because he hadn't stuck to this, uh, you know, this plan that they'd given him. So Brilliant. it's important that you get it right, and I, that, I think that makes the whole process quite credible, though, that they are putting in place lots of checks and balances so you can't just rock up and do it um but yeah so you have to film it take photos you have to get um you know the the actual race that you're doing to provide you with their certificate of course accuracy for measurement you have to have um the timing results you have to prove that the race was started by a loud signal that all the participants would have heard you know you have to go to great lengths so the easiest way is to just record it all on a camera and then you've proved everything you know what about the costume? What were the rules for the costume? Um, so it's things like, you know, you must wear the entire costume the whole time. You can't take any piece of it off at any point. Um, you can stop for rest breaks, but I, I don't think you're allowed to remove the costume. You know, you just obviously have to stand still. So there was all these rules about it. Um, but, you know, as long as you just get them to verify the costume and you do a big event where there's going to be lots of photographs, lots of video and you know lots of evidence for you to get then you know it's quite fine after that um, what did you run what time did you run i think i ran 137 um and i held i held the record for about nine months and then i was absolutely devastated when a polar bear from austria took my record <laughs> what did the it, polar bear run oh he, he ran about 130 something but oh, there's in, people listening to this now thinking i could do that I could do that. We're going to see an influx of, of yeah. record attempts for animals. Wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be great? We could have a, we could get a load of people to do it and make it up like a proper race. It would be, it would be a good laugh. I think it, in the end, um, because I lost the record, I lent, I lent my sheep costume to Glenn Turner, who you all know, and he went out there and he got it back. So the sheep got the record back in the end. <laughs> You're joking. I didn't know that. So for people who don't know, Glenn Turner, I work with Glenn Turner. Yeah. Um, I, know, I know Glenn really well. He's he's world record holder for fastest animal. Yeah, well, he he was, but I think even he's been taken down now. So, 
There's so many rapid animals in the world, Tom. You just don't appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. I didn't know. I'm, my mind's being open to a whole world. I wasn't even. It's going on around me. Like people I know are getting world records dressed as animals. I didn't even know. Good grief. Okay, carry on. Let's look at, uh, the story continues. So we it cross does. the line. Actually, knackered as a, as a as a what were we saying, lamb. Yeah, I, I was. I was the world record. So yeah, I was. I was more of a piece of mutton by the end of that, and then I've. I've uh, moved on to um 2013 i i started to get quicker because um what i did at this point i joined an athletic club because i felt that i'd gone as far as i could go on my own um and i wanted to have someone who knew what they were talking about and could give me some real specific training um so i started doing lots of speed work on the track at the athletics club my time started coming down a bit more so um, I did, I think it was 2013, I did the Silverstone half and the MK half. They were back-to-back weeks, and I ran them both in 125. So that was that was quite fast for me at the time. And But it was also a big mistake to run two races hard like that back-to-back because I picked up an injury. And then I ended up running the London Marathon that year, but I was injured. And I did the marathon on an injury, which was a stupid mistake with hindsight. Um, and I absolutely destroyed my left foot and then I was out for months and months after that so that was a massive lesson you know never never run injured I won't be doing that oh, again yeah. Um, so yeah there wasn't really much to report going forward and I got into 2014 and I, I was only just kind of getting back into fitness and running again but that was the Glasgow Commonwealth Games that year so I went up and volunteered in anti-doping up there and I, I um, was at the swimming and that was a, an interesting what was anti-doping like? I mean, what were you, what were you doing in anti-doping? Uh, so I, I was a chaperone. So um, they gave me a card with um, a set amount of, of words that I'd have to say to an athlete. And then I would I would go to the poolside and I would be told, right, this next race, um, draw out of this box a, a lane number. So I would get, you know, lane three or whatever. And then whoever was in that lane, I didn't know who was in the lane until they came out. And then I would have to get them at the end and te- explain to them they'd been selected for a random test. I'd read out this spiel that I was given. And then I would chaperone them to the doping control centre. Um, but they had a list of permitted activities they were allowed to do before attending doping control. And that was like having a cool down so that their muscles don't seize up and everything. Yeah. Going to see a doctor. You know, there was a certain list. And you'd find that they would all do them all anyway, because to them they're focused on their sport and their performance and anti-doping is probably an inconvenience really but um so i would just chaperone them around wherever they went until until we got to doping control and then i'd hand them over to the ucad uh, uk anti-doping staff to do the testing so i got got to hang out with a few top wow. swimmers <laughs> that must be interesting i'll take it you probably couldn't say none of them tried to uh, give you the slip through the mcdonald's in the, in the village no no luckily the lot i had were, were quite well behaved but <laughs> there were some stories of, of that they told us when they were kind of training us what to do about how people have done it in the past, and it's it's uh, you know included things that they would urinate into a towel or things like that to try and get rid of their urine and all kinds of things that that have Good been attempted. Grief. Yeah, um, at least you didn't at least you didn't have to watch. I thought for a minute you were going to say you had to watch them do it. No, luckily I was I was spared that. So. <laughs> I think that would be a bit mad for a volunteer, you know, just come and look at this. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Wow, that must be a, a fascinating insight. Anyway, okay, carry on. I'm, I'm enjoying this this journey through through your journey. Yeah, so um, I came away from Glasgow and, and by now my injury was long gone and I'd started to, to train hard again. And I went to the Royal Parks half in the October and I ran a 1.23 um, and I was... That was a personal best, um, but I actually, I was targeting just to go slightly under 125 really was what I was aiming for, because I didn't want to go too fast and then blow, um, but when I got to the end of that, I felt really strong, and I felt like I could have gone quicker, so uh, a month, I think it was a couple of weeks later, I was doing the Great South Run, and I decided to just run that at probably my 5k pace, and just see if I could hold it for 10 miles, and um, I managed to do 61.32 at the Great South Run, which was wow. a big confidence booster. Um, and I thought, well, it's only three more miles for, for the half. Um, so I carried on my winter training, um, looking towards doing the London Marathon again. And then I went to Silverstone in the March. 
And I thought, right, th just imagine this is the great south run again. I'm just going to run like that, but I'm just going to hang on as, as much as I can at the end. And I was trying to go under 120. <clears throat> and at the time, I was, um, I was being the face of vitality for the Reading Half Marathon. I was doing a blog for them. Um, and part of that was, uh, funny enough, uh, to speak with Martin Yelling to get some expert advice. Highlight. So, this got to be the highlight. Yeah, so the whole thing. I spoke to Martin on on the on the phone a couple of times, and he gave me some good tips about uh, pacing, really, just to get my pacing strategy right and everything. Um, and he he decided I should gun for it at the Reading um, half because he said that course would probably be faster in his opinion. But when I got yeah. to uh, when I got to Silverstone, which was before Reading. I just felt great that day and I just kind of had a feeling I can run fast today. So I just went for it and I didn't quite get sub 120. I got 120.51. Um, I came 45th in that race. And I mean, if you know that race, it's quite a prestigious race. It gets some big names like Scott Overall running it and things like that. So to come 45th in a race like that, I never, ever thought that would be imaginable when if I go back to 2009 when I'm on the phone saying how can I raise money for you I'd have never believed that would have been possible yeah, yeah. how far is a half marathon sorry yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. how far is how it far to, is to knowing knowing exactly how far it is exactly <laughs> exactly how to play it exactly how to pace it you know it, it's a uh, fight you know a few years on and and there I am doing that and I couldn't I couldn't have ever imagined it so I think you know the moral there is if you just try hard and keep keep working hard and pushing you never know what you're going to get to or what you can achieve, so it's always worth doing. Yeah, I mean, look, that's something we say, I think, quite a lot on the show. It, you know, people often ask, how fast do you, you think I can go? And the answer is, I don't know, but a lot faster than you'd imagine. And actually, with some consistent training over time, people, you know, you've gone from a two-hour half marathoner to an 80 minute half marathoner and you know we see it again and again and again where people take really big strides forwards and often it's often it's the biggest strides without a kind of a target or a goal to to get that much quicker but they just enjoy the process massively yeah exactly and you know getting getting to Silverstone that year as I said it was rolling on to London um, and then I ended up getting a good for age time at London so uh, nice. My my biggest regret about that because I haven't got my good for age time now. It's lapsed and I've not managed to um, repeat that time. But I, I should have gone for Boston straight away when I had the time because now I'm sat here thinking I really want to do Boston and I can't um, I can't do it because I'm not qualified. So I think if you ever get that good for age time, you've got to go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so you, now you've also you you went even longer. Tell tell us about the comrade journey because that's. I mean, that's a big step, isn't it? I mean, it is, a uh, you know, most people that have done marathons or multiple marathons still look at something like Comrades, you know, sort of two and a bit marathons over really, really hilly terrain and think, no, I couldn't do that. Yeah, it's like I said to you at the, at the Park Run Conference, uh, I blame you for Comrades because I listened, <laughs> I listened to this podcast and I heard you and Martin talking about it and, and just listening to the audio that you'd recorded mm. and... It just sounded like such an amazing challenge that, that was, again, up in the ante. It, it was quite difficult. It was longer than I'd ever gone. And I just thought, you know what, that, that's for me. I've got to do this. Um, but I didn't really know how I was going to afford it because it's not, not a cheap uh, affair to do with all the flights and everything. Um, so I saw a competition that was um, to win your bucket list adventure and you would, you would dictate what prize you would win, really. So I thought, right, that's, that's my way to do it. I'm going to go for this. So I, I put myself in this competition and I had to get um, like some public votes and get to the final and then some judges picked from the winners, uh, from the finalists, sorry. And I got picked as the winner. Um, so I, I actually got to go to Comrades and it was all, all pretty much paid for, yeah. It was, um, it was like, like... Was that just really lucky or are you, are, are you one of these competition wizards? No, I was, I was lucky there. I mean, obviously I had to get to the final, so I rallied the votes to get that far, but then it was down to judges and obviously I had no influence there. But I think they just saw that it, it was a proper bucket list adventure challenge that somebody wanted to do and, and pick me out the hat. Yeah, so I, I couldn't believe that. And they actually paid for two comrades entries <laughs> and um, enough for two flights and couple of sets of trainers so I took my friend Will with me um, I just rang him up and I said Will do you want to come and run comrades with me and 
it's all going to be free, it's all paid for. He said, oh, I better ask my missus, um, let, let, me, let me call you back. Can I call you back in a couple of days? I said, yeah, sure, no problem. Within five minutes, he rang me back, yeah, I'm coming. <laughs> so, so me and Will went out there and had, had such a blast. And we did, um, we did the North Beach Park run out there as well, which was massive. Yeah. There was about 2,000 runners there. What year was it? Uh, 2017, yeah, last year. So. Oh, well, yeah, it was 2000, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, it's the biggest park run in the world, isn't it? And yeah. It is, yeah. Is it, is it uh, crazy? Oh, it's phenomenal. It, it was like starting a half marathon or something like that, the amount of people that were there. And I just thought, this is not what I'm used to at park running no. Aylesbury, Buckinghamshire, you know, but it's... Uh, it was a massive park run. It was really good. And then, um, yeah, we obviously went on and did Comrades the next day. And that was the hardest thing I've ever done. And I, as it was my first ultra as well. So to take it on Comrades as your first was, yeah. was chucking yourself in at the deep end. And I knew that. But I don't think I appreciated how hard it was going to be. Just a combination of all those ridiculously steep hills, the heat, you know, tired from a flight, everything like that. And... It, I was, there was times in the middle in the real heat of the day where I'd take the water on at the water station the next one would be a kilometre away and after a few hundred metres I'd, I'd be gasping for water again and it was so warm um, but I got, yeah. got through it and it was an amazing experience um, and I walked isn't, I, isn't it phenomenal I mean it is it, it, I'm always careful I'm always cautious of, of bigging things up and then then becoming a disappointment when people do them like I, yeah it's brilliant it's brilliant it's brilliant and then someone thinks it's going to be amazing and then you say how was it and they go well it was alright but I was expecting a bit more but Comrades it absolutely lives up to it doesn't it oh. to, to all the hype and the start you know singing Shol Shaloza at the start and yeah. oh, you, you're just absolutely buzzing before you've even set off it, they really know how to set the atmosphere there um, and yeah. Yeah, it was amazing, and I'd, I'd recommend it to anybody if if you if you go for it, then just really got to give it your all. And one one thing they said at the expo is never ever stop moving forward. You know, even if you're taking a drink or you're speaking to a friend or anything like that, just keep moving forward because it's done on the gun time there, and the clock's always ticking. Obviously, and every second you stop, that will be why you miss the cut off at yes. the very end. Um, and I just kept that in my mind the whole way, just keep moving, keep moving. And I ended up getting there in 11.18 I did. Um, or, or Good lad. It, well, it was, so it was a, a Vic Clapham medal. I was hoping to get bronze because my South African friend says to me, uh, his name's Reese. he says, well, Comrades used to be 11 hours, so if you don't get under 11, you haven't really finished Comrades. <laughs> <He's going. laughs> Thanks, I got to the finish line. I was like, mate, I've finished. I don't care what time I did. I'm yeah. absolutely destroyed. But yeah, it was fantastic. And uh, oh, man, that's amazing. Honestly, just listening to you talk about it makes me want to go back there and do it again. I wish you didn't have to do the training for it. Like, you know, I wish you could just do it. And of course, people are still going, well, that's the point, isn't it? And I get it, it's the point. But oh, it's such a nice feeling. But the training is, is what, what did you do? How, how was your training different? for comrades than it was for a marathon um, it, it wasn't that different really um, all of the, the short stuff track sessions I was doing or just tempo runs things like that were all kind of marathon training based but it was just the long run I was, I was going a bit longer than I normally would so um, one of the, I had to, you obviously have to qualify for comrades so, um, by running a marathon so I did the Thames Meander Marathon um, and that has, that starts and finishes exactly where Kingston Park Run does. So I did the park okay. run at nine, and then I did the marathon at ten. Um, oh wow! Nice. And that sort of that with a little bit of extra warming up and down, it was about thirty miles that day. And I was just doing things like that just to get used to going further. But I mean, even when I got when I got through the first marathon at Comrades, I was tired, and th- I had more than a marathon left to do. And mentally, that was tough, you know, because <laughs> even yeah. though you've done these longer runs, you still can't run the full distance. And yeah, it's still unknown territory. So, but that was all I did really is just focus on the longer run and make it longer. So that was 2017. What's 2018 got an old, got on, got in store for you? Yeah, so I was really happy because um, last year I was an ambassador for the National Running Show, which was in January at the Birmingham NEC, and. Um, I was I was going through that and also um, was put into the running awards for the, for the best blog, and yes, so my, my blog is based on my YouTube videos. Really, it's more of a video blog, 
Um, I started that off in 2016 when um, I did the Cardiff half marathon. It was the world champs half marathon I did there. Um, and I was going to run the Great Wall of China and I wanted to, wanted to video that. So I started practicing making videos on just, you know, races in the UK. Um, and then by the time I got to China, I could make a good video. And I've just carried it on ever since, really. And I've made lots of different videos about half marathons I've done, marathons I've done, that kind of thing. Um, and I've got about 2,000 subscribers now, which has just built up gradually o over the time. So, um, And it's getting to the point now where occasionally I, g I do get people come up to me at races and say, oh, you know, I've seen your videos and that kind of thing, which is really nice to know that people are actually out there watching them and I'm not just making them for, for nothing. So, um, and. And yeah, so I'm in, I'm in for this award and um, I went to the National Running Show in January and that the running awards were there, they had a stand and they were announcing the shortlist and I didn't know that that was going to happen until I got there. So um, I, I was there for the shortlist announcement and my name was on it and I thought, wow, you know, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't have ever expected to, to get here and there's lots of other written bloggers that, that are there and I think really the category is mainly focused on that but they've allowed me into it so... Um, yeah, and I've been I've been in the final, so I'm looking to get votes at the moment for that because it's all done on public vote. And I was hoping that if any listeners uh, would would mind voting for me, I'd really appreciate that at, at theRunningAwards.com. And it's in the. Um, um, mate, I'm, I'm I'm looking I'm looking at it now. There's some pretty cool on your video, Bayes One Eight Seven, on YouTube. It's pretty cool. In fact, I've just seen the picture of you as as the lamb. Yeah, <laughs> that is like I can be quite scathing. People will know that I can be quite scathing of fancy dress on this show because sometimes I think fancy dress isn't really fancy dress for me. One of the criteria should be it has to legitimately really slow you down and be really uncomfortable and annoying. And if it's not really uncomfortable and annoying and slows you down, I don't think it counts. And that that lamb costume looks all of those things. Yeah, it was boiling hot. It was like wearing a soft toy on your head. <laughs> It was just crazy. But, yeah. Oh, mate, fantastic! It, yeah, it's amazing. So, so why do you do it? Like, you do. Are you in the camel, by the way. I'm being interrupted now by your video. Were you in that fancy dress camel? I was. Yeah, I was. I was at the front. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, why do you do it? You're obviously so. 2008, you're a total non-runner. Um, 2008. 18, 10 years later, here you are, you're, you're stuck into every single form of running you possibly can get involved in, and blogging and videoing and fancy dress and performance and tourism and ultras and marathons and the whole shebang. Why? What, what, why did it flick your switch? I just find running to be um, amazing for so many reasons. You know, it, it keeps me fit and healthy, which is important. You know, as a dad, I want to be able to play with my daughter. I, you know, I want to be able to do my job properly and all those things. And it help it helps with that. It's it's a big mental stress reliever as well for me. I mean, I've got um, a pretty stressful job as a detective in the police, and when when I come home from a bad day there, if I can just go out and blast out a run and clear my head, it's it's fantastic. It's just like a, a coping mechanism really um, for that. And there's been times when I have been injured, as as I described. Oh, and you still... Sorry. Oh, sorry, Richard. We can edit this a little bit out. I just, I just lost you. You just broke up a little bit. Oh, again. that's just, all right. Um, just say about um, you know a uh, stressful job, and then go from there. Yeah. So um, I've got a stressful job as a detective in the police. So when I come home from a bad day at work or a stressful day, I can go out and blast out a run, and it really helps clear my head and get me back on the level. And there's actually been times where in the past I've been injured, as I described, and I haven't been able to run, and I've really noticed. Um, how more stressed I feel without running so it's definitely beneficial for that um, and I really enjoy the social side as well I absolutely love going down to park run at the weekend and just seeing all my friends and hanging out and then you go to a race on the Sunday and you know I've got I've got friends that I don't see day to day but I see them you know once a once a week or once a fortnight at one run or another and we have we have a good time you know so I really do enjoy the social side of it as well and I spread that even further yeah. with, with the YouTube videos and the blogging and all of that because I think there's so many like-minded people out there that you can connect with um, and, you know, you can't physically meet everybody but using video and 
you know social media you can obviously encourage lots more runners or get more people running who have been thinking about it and I just hope that if they watch a video I've done and they think well yeah that looks really good fun I'll go and give that a go you know so it's uh it's there's loads of reasons I do running really yeah mate it's absolutely amazing so if people want to vote to you they can go to well how do they find you on YouTube because if you want to laugh and 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 look at some brilliant running videos um, yeah, so my my How do my find you on YouTube? well, my absolute chick magnet internet handle is Baze one eight seven, which is B A Z E one eight seven, which I came up with when I was about twelve, and it's like the first part of my surname and the last part of my parents' landline phone number. So, you know, it's got it's <laughs> I, I've just kept it ever since. <laughs> but yeah, it's Baze one eight seven. I'm I'm the same on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, everything, and. Um, I've also got, I've just set up a website, um, bays187.com, um, which was set up by um, another YouTuber actually called the FOD Runner. He did that for me and he's done a fab job. Base one, it's B-A-Z-E 187. Yeah. And then and if people if people love the videos and they love what you do, how do they vote for you for the, for the running awards? Yeah, so you go to therunningawards.com and you just have to register with an email address and then you can vote for me in the online and publications category. And then it's um, blog, personal, and then you'll see Bayes 187. And then you can click vote there. But you can also vote for Marathon Talk as well in the um, best online community section uh, on the same. Right. So, and if you vote in five categories, then you get given a discount code for um, a website where you can buy your running shoes and things like that. So it's worth voting in a few categories and voting for your best races. God, you're, I tell you what, you are so good at this publicity stuff. No wonder you won the holidays, comrades. <laughs> it's, uh, Martin and I are so used to this, we've not even mentioned it. It's uh, brilliant. So vote for Marathon Talk and uh, Bayes 187 at the Running Wards. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll buy you a pint on the evening. Exactly, yeah. And uh, I'll see you down there. I'm looking forward to it. Now, listen, I can't let you go, obviously, without asking you the one question we ask all of our interviewees. Uh, you know the score, six months, perfect training, one mile on the track. What are you going to do? Yeah, I thought about this before um, I came on. So a, a couple of years ago, I ran the City of London mile um, and I did the Westminster mile as well. So, and I think I did nice. those around the five, five minutes 20 mark. Okay. Um, so I think if I was given six months to prepare and do it properly, I could dip under the five minutes so i'm gonna say 4.59 oh yeah you're gonna join to use a comrade analogy the cop the f- sub five minute bus yes uh, which has become a bus actually in in, in andrea moritz barry who's the comrade who i think she was the comrade's ambassador i think from canada uh, Barry Murray, Chris Fulcher, David Henry, Steve Ingham, Ellie Greenwood, Comrades Champion, Jeff Whiteman, Greg Brock, Hannah Aldroyd, Ivo Gormley, James Cracknell, Jamie Ramsey, Jim Murray, Kelly Holmes, Laura Fountain, Mark Daly, Michael Westphal, Richard Naruka, Rob DiCostella, Sorrel Walsh and Tracy Morris. What a uh, eclectic bunch of running legends. Wow. You're right in the middle of them. Well, if I'm up there with uh, Kelly Holmes and Cracknell, then you know, I can't be doing too bad because they're, yeah. they're absolute legends. So I'm quite pleased to, yeah. to be there <laughs> Richard it's been an absolute pleasure thank you for sharing the story of, of your journey yeah no problem at all um, yeah and hopefully we'll be uh, celebrating with you at the running awards um, in April yeah excellent thanks very much Tom